You hear this all the time that doing these big heavy compound movements or resistance training increases androgens, things like testosterone, DHT, DHEA, and so forth. Does anyone know how that actually happens? Like what about move, what about, in, what is it about engaging motor neurons under heavy loads sends a signal to the endocrine system, hey, release testosterone. I've never actually been able to find that in a textbook. Yeah, well, I mean, that, and how can I do more of that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, as, as much as I know, you know, and again, I'm digging out into the annals of Duncan French's kind of brain now. But uh, yeah, I mean, I think it's a stress response, right? It's mechanical stress and it's metabolic stress, and these are, you know, the downstream regulation of, of testosterone release at the gonads um, comes from many different areas. Um, you know, the, the, my work primarily looked at, um, you know, catecholamines and, and, and sympathetic arousal. So and things like epinephrine, adrenaline. Correct. Yeah, epinephrine, adrenaline, um, you know, a, a noradrenaline, um, how, how they were signaling the signaling cascade using, you know, the HPA axis, releasing um, cortisol, and then, you know, looking at how that also influenced the adrenal medulla to release, um, you know, androgens and then signaling that at the gonads. That raises an interesting question. So, in uh, presumably weight training in women, people would. Uh, who don't have testes, also it increases testosterone. Yes, yes. And is that purely through the adrenals? When women lift weights, their adrenal glands release testosterone? Absolutely. I mean, that is the only area of, of testosterone release for females. And yes, it's the same downstream cascade. Obviously, the extent to which it happens is, is significantly less in females, but that's how you, there's good, good data out there that shows, you know, females can increase their anabolic environment, their internal anabolic milieu, um, using resistance training as a stressor. And then they get the consequent muscle tissue growth, um, you know, whether it's tendon, ligament, adaptations, you know, the, the, the beneficial consequences of resistance training, which is driven by anabolic stimuli. Yeah, I have two questions about that. The first one is something that you mentioned, which is that the, the androgens, the testosterone comes from the adrenals under resistance loads in women. Is the same true in men? I mean, we hear that the testes produce testosterone when we weight train uh, for, for men that have testes, but um, do, do we know whether or not it's the adrenals or the testes in men that are increasing testosterone? Yeah, More, both, a little bit from each? The, there's a, there's a, the, the field is divided presently um, in as much as understanding the acute, adre the, the acute um, adrenergic response in terms of you know anabolic um, response to exercise in an acute phase and the exposure to um, you know, a stimulus that is stress driven, which might be partly from the adrenal glands, partly from the gonads versus a longitudinal exposure um, to anabolic environments, which is primarily driven by obviously the gonads and the release of the endocrine environment from, from testosterone release of the gonads. So the, this, the, the field is split in terms of how exercise is promoting hypertrophy, you know, muscle tissue growth, um, and whether that is very much a, a, an adrenals um, stimuli or if that's significant enough in these acute responses versus the longitudinal exposure to just elevated basal levels of, of anabolic te testosterone uh, uh, habitual levels. Could you say that there's a there are some general principles of training that favor testosterone production in terms of that the, that somebody who's not an elite athlete could use somebody who's already adapted to weight training somewhat like they know the difference between a dumbbell and a barbell and they know how, they know the various movements they're not going to damage themselves but once they're doing that i mean i've heard shorter sessions are better than longer sessions but in rep loads wait, now there's a lot of parameter space but if you were going to throw out some of the um the parameters that you think are most important to pay attention to for the typical person who's trying to use weight training to build or maintain muscle yeah lose body fat, so body recomposition, and or stay strong and healthy for sport of mm -hmm. a different kind. Yeah, so the work that we obviously, you know, I was exposed to back in my PhD, um, it, it was a double-edged sword. And as much as testosterone is really stimulated by an intensity factor uh, and also a volume factor. Now, growth hormone is a little bit different. That's largely driven by an intensity factor alone. Oh, really? Correct. I always thought the growth hormone was driven by volume, which just goes to show you. Maybe I've got No, 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 no. I think you're probably right. It just goes to show you that most of what's out there on the internet right. is completely Right. Not only not only is it wrong, it's usually backwards. So no, trust I, I, <laughs> I no trust your instinct because <laughs> because I think people just make this stuff up. Right. right? I, because it's very hard to measure growth hormone and testosterone, and uh, and I can't imagine most of the the stuff that I see out there. They're taking drips and and you know 
measuring free versus bound and all this kind of stuff. But that's what you do in, in laboratories. Right, yeah. yeah. You, you look at total composition and you look at how much of that is free circulating yeah. in the system, how much is bound and therefore biologically active, bound to receptor, creating right. adaptation. Um, but yeah, coming back to testosterone in terms of the training strategies, it's largely driven by both an intensity and a volume factor. So if you look at many of the exercise interventions that we use to try and investigate and interrogate testosterone, um, it was it was usually you know a, a six by ten protocol. So you touch in six about, by ten meaning yeah six sets of ten repetitions, which is you know it's quite a large you know sixty repetitions is quite a large volume for a, a single exercise. And that was usually pitched at about 80% intense of a one repetition max intensity. Okay, so 80% of the one rep max, six six sets of 10 reps separated by rest of like- Two minutes. Two minutes, which yeah. is actually pretty fast, yeah. at least to me. It Anytime is you, you see these two to three minutes, when you're actually watching the clock, yeah. Those two minute rest periods go by pretty fast. By the third, fourth set, you're, you're dying for more. Yeah? yeah. And I think, you know, we, you know, we, we formulated that kind of exercise protocol to really target you know the, the release of testosterone and try and drive up these anabolic environments to study the you know the endocrine um, you know consequences. But I think that's 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 the type of protocol that is mo most advantageous for driving anabolic environments. And that was it for the workout. Yeah, yeah I mean, we, we would do that in a back squat. So, you know, multi-joint, um, you know, challenging exercise, multi-muscle, multi-joint, 80% load of, of your one repetition max, and then six by 10. We did play around with, you know, your classic German volume type 10 by 10 um, kind of protocols, um, but they were just unsustainable at that 80%. The, the key to what we also did was we always adjusted um, the loads to make sure that it was 10 repetitions that were sustained. So if the load was too too high and an athlete or a participant had to uh, drop the weight on, on the sixth repetition, we would unload the bar and make sure they completed the 10 repetitions. Bringing me back to the point of it's an intensity and a volume derivative that, that is gonna be most advantageous for testosterone release. Intensity, when I think intensity, I think epinephrine, adrenaline. And uh, since you have a background in right. you know, catecholamines and testosterone, last time I was uh, here at the USC Performance Institute, we had a brief conversation, and I, I want to make sure I got the details right, that in the short term, and a big increase in stress hormone can lead to an increase in testosterone, like a, like a parachute jump. Correct. Um, but uh, so stress can promote the release of testosterone. Yeah. That was news to me. 